Hello, everyone. This is Greg Salmieri, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to. Uh, let's see if this is working. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Philosophy for Living on Earth. That's the Ayn Rand Institute's weekly webinar series, exploring philosophical questions as they arise in the context of day-to-day -day life. Today's question is: Isn't everybody selfish? Much of the Institute staff is off at the Ayn Rand conference in uh, Porto Alegre, Brazil this weekend. So I'm here guest hosting today. Uh, joining me in a bit uh, will be Aaron Smith, who's been left to hold the fort over at ARI's offices in Santa Ana. He'll come on the line later to moderate the discussion and perhaps to participate in it. Uh, we're hoping you guys will have lots of questions to ask and thoughts to share. But before we go to that, I'm going to kick things off with some comments on the question of the day. I'll speak for 15 minutes, maybe a little longer, and then we will open things up. So again, the question is, isn't everybody selfish? Uh, we normally think of selfishness as a character trait that distinguishes some people from others, or at least some action from others. Selfishness is about how one acts, what kind of motive one has whether one acts for one's own sake or for that of others, at least as the term is generally understood. I have pictured on the screen a lot of different people who act in fairly different ways. All of them have done something dramatic uh, for good or ill, and in some cases it's controversial whether it's good or ill, uh, or they've done more than one dramatic thing, but lots of pictures. Uh, some of these people are generally thought to be selfish, others not to be. And so the question, isn't everyone selfish? is meant to suggest that all these people and everyone else is alike. And not only that they're alike in a respect they're not always thought to be, but that they're alike in a way that belies our view of the ones that are unselfish. Everybody is more like the ones that we would be prone to call selfish. And by we, I mean people in general, uh, the term as it's commonly used. So isn't everyone selfish? You're saying everyone is the same. Everyone is more like those of the people on the screen who might be called selfish, say um, Bernie Madoff or um, Jeff Bezos. Indeed, those two are like each other is part of the normal way people use the word selfish. And then isn't everyone selfish? Is saying everyone, including Nathan Hale and Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King, are much like the two of them are. Moreover, I think it's most often understood not to mean everyone's selfish some of the time, but that every action is selfish. Every action is motivated in the same way. So what we're going to think about today is why someone might think this and whether it's true. I think it is not true. Uh, and I'll say a bit about why. Of course, selfishness is generally regarded as a bad trait. And that is, I think, important background for what we're talking about here. When someone suggests that everyone is selfish, they're often suggesting it cynically, sometimes in an attempt to justify an action of their own that they worry is selfish and therefore wrong. And then people who respond to or are uncomfortable with this suggestion typically resist it because they think it amounts to suggesting that no person or action is generally good or genuinely good. For a kind of pop cultural example of this kind of argument, look to the show television program Friends. There's an episode where Joey, uh, who's an actor, is about to be part of a charity performance, but he's only doing it to advance his career. He doesn't care much about the cause. And his friend Phoebe says, well, that's selfish. And Joey responds that all good deeds are selfish. Indeed, all actions are selfish. And Phoebe's really worried about this. She's, uh, it's dispiriting. It seems like it's taking away her view that goodness is possible in the world. And she spends the whole episode trying to prove that this isn't show so, because as she puts it, she can't stand to live in a world where Joey is right. So this is a kind of humorous um, pop cultural manifestation of this kind of argument, this kind of thinking. For a more um, scholarly and historically significant version, we can turn from uh, Joey and Phoebe to Emmanuel here. This is Immanuel Kant, who thought that a truly good action has to be disinterested. And so in that sense, it has to be selfish. It's not the only requirement of it, but it's a central one. 
And yet Kant thinks we can't ever know for sure whether an action, even whether your own action when you're taking it, is like this, whether it's really selfish. No matter how much you look into yourself, uh, it might be that no matter how, you know, how closely you introspect, you can find nothing but the pure motive of duty that could have been powerful enough to move you to take this or that action, to move you to take a great sacrifice, as Kant calls it, something that he would normally think of as admirable. But you can infer from the fact that you can't discover in yourself any motive uh, other than that of duty, other than that of morality that would lead you to make this sacrifice. You can infer from that that there was really not some secret impulse of self-love under the false appearance of duty that was actually determining the determining cause of the will. Maybe what's really driving you is some hidden selfish desire. And Kant takes this idea to mean you, that, that you can't know that you're not really being moved by selfish interests and that other people aren't. That you, he takes this to mean that you can't really know that anyone is ever acting morally. Indeed, he says, because of this, there are always cynical philosophers in every age who deny that anyone can ever act morally. Kant himself thinks we can, um, but what Kant points out is that what the cynical philosophers doubt is not what morality requires, at least that's how Kant thinks of it, it's only whether we're able to do what morality requires. Everyone knows that being good would require being selfless, would require acting on some motive other than your self-interest, and then the question is only, can we really do that? And that's what happens with Phoebe. She doesn't doubt whether goodness would require being unselfish. She's scared by Joey's idea because it makes her think, well, maybe no one's ever really good. Kant, in the end, thinks people sometimes are and can be, but he thinks it's something you just have to have faith in that you can't know. So I think that's typically... Uh, the place people are coming from when they ask, is everyone selfish? It's a cynical idea. Maybe everyone's just selfish. And uh, you use it to justify your own selfish and action, which you think is bad, or to wonder if anyone's capable of goodness. There is another in the history of thought, though, way that this question is sometimes approached. And here I have uh, up the philosophers uh, Socrates and Jeremy Bentham as kind of... Um, targets of this. You get this kind of view also sometimes in psychology. People who are, just take it as read that all motivation is selfishness or self-interested in some way. They uh, don't consider this morally good or bad. They just consider it a background kind of thing. And then they try to, they're either not interested in morality one way or the other, or they try to draw the distinction between good or bad actions on other grounds. Whether the action is, is well-informed and will lead to the best in the long run, uh, is maybe how Socrates would draw it, or whether it uh, helps other people as well as helping oneself, is how Bentham would think of it. This kind of way of thinking uh, that this kind of morally neutral or amoral or not too concerned about morality way of thinking that everyone is self-interested is, is pretty common these days among economists. Uh, I've encountered it also among a lot of right-wingers who I think are influenced by those economists. Uh, you encounter it also sometimes in psychology, it's more or less the view I myself held when I was a teenager. Some people confuse this kind of view that everyone is selfish um, with Rand's view that we ought to be selfish. But I think people who are a little more astute see that these are very different views, that everyone is a certain way versus that everyone ought to be a certain way and that you ought to be a certain way. And it really doesn't make sense to tell somebody that they ought to be a certain way that they ought to act selfishly, that they ought to be selfish, to write a book, The Virtue of Selfishness, as Rand did, if uh, you think everyone inevitably will act that way. So you get some people who are assuming this kind of everyone's selfish view, uh, this view called psychological egoism sometimes, uh, will criticize the uh, Ayn Rand objectivist position that selfishness is a good thing from this point of view, saying you know, there's no point to this, there's no point to saying you ought to be selfish, when everyone inevitably will be. And it's uh, in response to that, that there's an article in The Virtue of Selfishness asking the question we're talking about today, isn't everyone selfish? The article is by Nathaniel Brandon, who was an uh, sort of junior colleague or junior associate of Rand. Um, and he treats this as an objection. People often object to egoists, to objectivists, to people who uh, uphold the philosophy of rational self-interest, saying, isn't everyone selfish, so that there's no point to your advice, uh, it, it's, it's trivial or, or vacuous, or uh, there's no need for it. 
I'm going to take a somewhat different take on the question today because I think it's equally often asked from the more cynical perspective. And I think it's, it's uh, that is where you assume uh, morality would require selflessness or unselfishness and think uh, that maybe nobody's moral, the kind of Kantian or Frenzian perspective on it. Um, so what I say is going to have a lot in common with Brandon's article, but I'm, I'm thinking of the question as at least some of the time coming from a different place than he is. Now, one thing that Brandon nicely does in that article uh, is bring out what argument there is for the view that everyone is selfish. And it's an argument we find way back in Socrates, although Brandon doesn't mention this. Um, one way of putting it is that everyone is motivated in some way or other to take whatever action he takes. And in that sense, the person could be said to want, or at least in some way be positively disposed towards what he's doing. So if you call that thing, wanting to do it, being positively disposed to do it, having some motive to do it when you do it, being selfish, or you call that the things being in your interest, then yes, everything you do is trivially in your interest. But that's not what anybody means when they call someone selfish, that at some level, in some sense, in some way, they were positively disposed towards their action or they wouldn't have taken it. If you look at all of the different people who there are in the world, uh, and we think about all of their motives, and all the motives everyone has for doing anything, these motives are very different from one another. Think not of the ultimate motive, which you might have the theory is their self-interest, whatever that is, but think about the proximate motives that people have for uh, the various things they do, the various things that are pictured on the screen here. We have inventors and entrepreneurs creating companies, uh, people fomenting revolutions in their country, people taking over countries and trying to seize power, uh, people sexually molesting children, uh, people saving people from the Holocaust, gangsters, civil rights leaders, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, what do all these people have in common? If you ask uh, why are you doing it? What are you after to each of them? Or you just reflect on what they're after. Your at least first brush answers would be different things, right? Osama bin Laden here is trying to establish a caliphate. Um, Hitler here is trying to uh, purify Germany of uh, people who he sees as uh, infestations of it and establish a new right. Uh, some people are trying to gratify their sexual urges some of them in abusive ways that we have pictured. Uh, Bill Gates is trying to work towards a world where there's a computer in every house in America all running Microsoft software. Uh, I'm not sure how Al Capone conceived of what he was doing, but presumably trying to amass a lot of money uh, with at least part of it. Mother Teresa is trying to um, devote herself to Jesus and spread the gospel. Uh, by ministering to the poorest of the poor, right? These are what they would say they were doing. These are what they would say their goals were. Do they all stem from some one goal of achieving what's good for themselves? And do they all think the same thing is good for themselves? What's the evidence of that? To think more about that, to think more about whether all the very different things these people are doing and pursuing, at least at a first brush, proximate superficial level, really deeply come to the same thing. Let's turn away from these really kind of large scale, profound and difficult cases. We've probably not met most of these people or people who've done things on their scales to kind of everyday cases of action and the diversity of motives that we find behind them. So everyday actions that people do and in some sense want to do or feel like doing when they do them. Someone eats a nice meal or lights up a cigarette or cuddles his kid, or shakes someone's hand, or cuts someone off in traffic, or lets someone into traffic, or holds a door for someone, or gives someone a pleasant smile or a compliment, or rudely whistles at someone, or spends time with a friend, or goes for a jog, or buckles down to work. There's such a variety of different actions here. Some of these actions we think well of, some we think bad of. Some we think benefit the agent, others we tend to think, that is, some we think benefit the person taking them, and others we tend to think are bad for the person taking them. Certainly most of us think that about smoking, for example. Um, some of them are neutral for the agent, or we don't know what they are. And there's such a wide variety of proximate motives for these actions. Many of these motives involve thinking a lot about other people and what they want. When you hold the door for someone, 
You're in some sense doing it for them and you're thinking about what they want when you buy someone a present. But moreover, usually when people take action to these sorts, any of the sorts up on the screen, very little thought is given to what the actions add up to or result in. You have a motive in the moment. It occurs to you to do this. It seems like the thing to do. You feel like doing it. This is true for the things we might think well of or for the things we might think ill of. And you do it. And you usually don't. Most people don't most of the time think much beyond that. So what is meant and what evidence is there that behind this great variety of different motives that people are aiming at, different things, is some one thing their self-interest? We could ask about any of these things, like the smoking or the thing the person's eating or the relationship they're in. Is it really good for you? You want to do it, but is it good for you? And answering that takes thought. And it's only in the context of this kind of thought that the idea of self-interest even comes up. Self-interest is a complicated term. Even the idea of someone's good is a, self, it's a complicated idea. It only comes up once one is reflecting on his individual actions and his motives for them, once he's evaluating them, thinking about what they add up to or lead to and whether that's what he wants. And so to be pursuing one's self-interest, whether that's an admirable or an unadmirable thing to do, is something thoughtful something reflective. It requires having a view, forming a view, developing a view of what's good for you as a whole, and then selecting your more concrete goals accordingly. Of course, it doesn't mean that you'd never do what you feel like, but you don't take your feeling like something as determinative. You have to think about what am I after out of life, and how does this fit into it? So it's, and it's really a substantial question what my self-interest is. This isn't yet to say that it's admirable, that it's a substantial question, that it's admirable to pursue your self-interest. Perhaps someone could be a thoughtful conniver, a sensible knave, as the philosopher David Hume called it. But it is to say that the whole issue requires a lot of thought. There's no basis then for grouping every action by every person on every motive together and calling them selfish. The person who says everyone is selfish is wrong. The thing these people are doing here are just too different. And I think we've seen, and the, the motives for doing them and the results of them are too different. The, the, the state of mind that results in these actions are just wildly different for all the different actions people do, both casual everyday actions and grand scale ones that make them paradigms of different types of action. And I, so I've indicated why there's no basis for grouping all action together under the label selfish. Every action by every person under every motive. But for the same reason, I think it's a mistake to group together even the actions that people typically call selfish in ordinary English. Even this group is far too diverse, far too different from one another that people now pictured to say they're all acting in the same way. They're all acting selfishly. A judgment of them that's almost always accompanied by blame of them. It's too diverse a group with too diverse motives and too diverse effects. Let's consider some of the kinds of people who fall into this group, again, with more everyday examples at first, and what would drive them, some of the kinds of behaviors. So there's a guy who's just being a petty, inconsiderate jerk. You might call him selfish. But this action is different in what motivates it, in what makes it bad, and in what kind of effects it has from a different kind of action that we might call selfish and often do, the action of predatory behavior. The guy in the striped shirt here in this picture isn't just being inconsiderate or thoughtless. He's thinking about the person he's taking the, the phone from, and he's thinking, how can he get something out of her to her disadvantage, right? And here's this kind of petty, well, not petty, but uh, a petty theft, I guess, a predatory behavior. And there are all kinds of other predatory behaviors here, uh, from big-scale criminals and gangsters to financial fraudsters to sexual predators, right? This is all... These things are all alike in a way, although there were differences among them, in that they're predatory, but it's coming from a different place than, uh, than the merely inconsiderate behavior. And this, again, is coming from a different place from the kind of behavior of dictators, which is motivated by something different. These people at least claim, and I think often sincerely claim, to be motivated by ideas when they commit their horrors. And generally, they're ideas that preach self-abnegation, and that don't get much for them personally. 
uh, at least not much of what most of us want out of life. So in what sense are they being the same as the other people that we looked at? In what sense are they being selfish? Maybe they were like the predators and that they're both preying on people. Maybe there's something in common that maybe they're not as thoughtful as they should be about their lives. Although some of them scheme quite maniacally to do what they're doing. But are they really all the same? And then there's another category of people who are called selfish. All the people we've looked at before, who I don't really think belong quite together either, are bad. They're doing something wrong. But there's a third category or a one remaining category. And this is the category that I think really uh, makes the fact that we use this concept, selfish in this way, this word in this way, a real problem. There are ambitious, productive people, people who have a career goal or a life goal that's valid, good, productive, helps to sustain human life on earth, and who perceive this goal single-mindedly, ambitiously, with dedication, people like the great industrialists of the past and the present, and who are also called selfish, also thought to be acting for themselves and therefore alike to all the other people we just looked at, even if they're not alike to everyone all the time. So what do all these people have in common? Inconsiderate jerks, predators, power lusters, evil ideologues, and ambitious industrialists. These kinds of people and the actions that are characteristics of them do not belong together. They're just too different, different in their motives and different in their eminently predictable consequences. People who are behaving in these ways are not behaving in the same ways and are not the same kind of people. And if you reflect on what it would really look like to think about and care about and pursue what's best for yourself, what plausibly is good for you over the long term, only one of these sorts of people is plausibly an instance of that kind of behavior. And that is the kind of ambitious industrialists that we just talked about. But to their ranks, we might add a lot of other people in a lot of other activities. Anyone who approaches his work thoughtfully and ambitiously on whatever scale in whatever career. People who are acting to promote other values and people who they personally care a lot about and who add a lot to their lives. Think about someone cherishing a friend, parent nurturing a child. And also people who recognize the value of a just society and of freedom and are working to achieve it. These people who we might tend to think of as unselfish have a lot more in common with these uh, selfish business people and industrialists than any of them do with the kind of creeps that we talked about earlier or the villains. So those are some thoughts to just get us started off thinking about the question of whether everyone's selfish and about selfishness in general. Um, a few uh, quick announcements and thoughts before we get to questions. I want to tell you about uh, next week, Ankar Gatte will be uh, doing a session on whether free will is an illusion, uh, whether this fork in the road is real or not. So tune in for that. Um, we're going to, we also have, we want to know, or the Institute wants to know what questions you have that you'd like to see a webinar on. So you can, um, you can uh, email such questions to webinar at einrand.org and maybe someone will come on some Saturday and, and uh, address it. And then finally, the Institute is thinking about um, who we're reaching with this, uh, with this program. And uh, so in order to help their, uh, their figuring that out, there's an audience poll about uh, you guys and your familiarity with Ayn Rand. Are you people who have read everything she's written, read and written and follow everything the Institute does? Or are you people who are just uh, discovering and starting to think about these ideas for this series? So there's a poll that you can uh, fill out and um, I'm trying to launch it now. Yeah, there's a poll that you can fill out that will be really helpful to the folks at ARI who are planning this series if you do it. I've just launched that. And uh, with that, let's, uh, let's turn to Q&A and general discussion. Uh, Aaron, will you wanna join me online? Yes, hi, Greg. Hi, Aaron. I'm gonna um, stop the, uh, the full screen video share so we now look like larger heads. 
And uh, what are pe what's on people's minds and on yours? Yeah, I want to start with a question of my own. This is something I, I hear a lot, and I think in general, um, objectivists uh, hear a lot. Um, you've been pushing the point that the way in which people use the term selfishness conventionally is what I'm going to call a package deal. It groups together things that don't necessarily belong to, or actually, they don't properly belong together. Um, but the question I hear a lot is, um, but w don't we need a term then? Suppose you want to uh, salvage or recapture the term selfishness for something virtuous. What do we don't we need another term to capture the phenomenon of the the selfish jerk or the whatever the person is who's called conventionally selfish? Like if you're going to grab selfishness for the good the good stuff, well, what do you call the yeah, bad stuff? The, the bad stuff, yeah. So I don't think there is a sort of bad person who's called selfish. So if you take the word selfish as it's conventionally used, I think it includes good people and good behaviors as well as bad people and bad behaviors. And if you take out all the good people and just you know, leave over the bad people and say, well, we're not going to call them selfish anymore, either because we want to use the word selfish for something positive, or we just want to avoid the word altogether to, to get away from this confusion. Say, what should we call the bad people who are left? Well, you can call them bad. They're all bad people. But um, there's nothing more in common about them than that they're bad. And in particular, there's a lot of very different sorts of bad people who have nothing in common other than the fundamental thing, which is being basically thoughtless, not be, being irrational, uh, that makes them bad. So if you think about, um, you remove Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and so forth and uh, uh, from the selfish list, and you think about like a guy who's rude and doesn't tip well and uh, talks during movies and maybe cuts you off in traffic. So, you know, this guy's like a jerk. Uh, he's inconsiderate. He's thoughtless. Um, he's uh, impolite. Those are all bad things. But other than that they're bad, what does he have in common with a pickpocket or a rapist? Um, those people have in common with one another that they're exercising force, that they're criminals. But there's nothing really in common about the motive between them and the, um, and the inconsiderate guy other than that they're not being, uh, being uh, reasonable, that they're not acting well. And um, the inconsiderate person might not even have a bad motive. He's just not you know, thinking enough about all the factors that are relevant to determining his action, whereas the predator, is, is, uh, I think, has something really wrong about him. And then even among predators, there's a real difference between people who are pursuing something that in other contexts would be a legitimate value, and they are now pursuing it in a way that's self-destructive and destructive to other people and pursuing it out of context, um, like uh, someone who maybe will cheat in a, in a financial transaction or something, uh, and that's his kind of predation, and he's, he wants money, and he thinks this is the way to get it. That's bad. Uh, it's not clear to me that it's the same kind of motive that would make somebody uh, a sociopath who wants to commit a murder or a rapist who not just wants the sex, but uh, revels in the feeling of power he has over the person he's exploiting, right? And these are not the same kind of people, again, as um, grand-scale monsters like a, a Hitler or somebody, right? So um, it's not the case that there's one, a kind of good selfish person and a kind of bad selfish person. There are good and bad people, good and bad actions. But once you narrow down past that, um, the bad actions don't have anything in common other than their irrationality, which is what makes them bad. And they don't have a common motive more narrowly than that. They're not more self-focused than other actions in particular. So let me ask a follow-up then. So why do you think it is then that so many people use selfishness as a package deal? So if, if these people are uh, have you know disparate motives, disparate disparate effects on their lives, and yet we all group them uh, with the same term, and we seem to be more or less comfortable with that. It's in a lot of the dictionaries. So this is the way people use it. Why do you think it's so common uh, that grouping? So I think it comes from a kind of thoughtlessness that is really pervasive about our own motives and what we want out of life that's reinforced by a wrong view of morality. So if you think of morality as something imposed on you, 
which is a natural way to think about it if you just learn a bunch of commandments, if you learn a bunch of directives, do this, don't do that, but not really learn why to do them. And you're raised that way and you're not very thoughtful about it. You'll find that those commandments are often coming up against your other motives, your other desires. Um, and so morality will seem to be against what you want to do. And then if it's further sold as about other people and their interests, which it is um, not always and everywhere, but often uh, in our society, it will start to seem that morality is an enemy of whatever values you have. So I think it takes work and thought to kind of put your many different things you might value or be motivated towards together into a conception of your interest. But the idea of a um, morality that's an imposition wholly apart from the rest of your values and views uh, is something that kind of thwarts you from forming a conception of your interest other than the idea that it's whatever can form, as Kant puts it, a counterweight to your duties. And uh, I think that whole way of thinking, which is sort of maybe natural for, for a child, particularly if he's not raised with enough becauses uh, when he's told why to do things, uh, can create, a, fosters a resentment of morality and a kind of identification of yourself with um, some of your most obvious or perceptually salient motives, which are sometimes then thwarted by uh, what morality is calling for or the morality you're taught is calling for. Okay, we got a question uh, in various forms that I think it's worth addressing. Uh, again, this is one I hear a lot worth talking about. Um, if there's all this confusion around the term selfishness, mm -hmm. and you've pointed to a lot of it, um, why not just use the term self-interest, which has a kind of more neutral, maybe more abstract, more philosophical sounding, less morally weighted to the negative, so to speak, why not just leave selfishness for that, for that hodgepodge of whatever, uh, and use self-interest? Uh, well, whether whether and when to use the concept selfish positively, whether to write a book with the title "The Virtue of Selfishness," as Ayn Rand did, um, and whether to use the word, if you agree with her view of morality, whether to use that term in endorsing it, is a separate question from whether to use the word for the hodgepodge that it means too often in common parlance. So that hodgepodge, we don't need a word for. It's something that is stultifying to our thought, that confuses us, and we want to get rid of that. So the first step is there is no such thing as that hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge, and a hodgepodge isn't something that deserves a word. It, all it does is causes us, it is, serves to confuse us. So I would take it as separate points, reject that conventional term selfish, don't use it. And then as a separate question, uh, should we use selfish then to describe positive behavior or should we, or, or, and the fact about positive behavior that it's good for the person who does it, a fact that I didn't argue for here, but which Ayn Rand argues for in that book. Um, well, I think which term to use is very context dependent. I don't say you should always use the word selfish in every situation. But if you choose another word like self-interest, the, the very facts uh, that le led to the hodgepodge with selfishness infect that other word in about five minutes. Um, well, I don't know. I shouldn't do something that's only self-interested. Uh, there's a kind of euphemism treadmill that goes on where you take – so long as the phenomenon of acting for yourself and so long as the motive of serving yourself and your own interests are viewed thoughtlessly and as bad, which they are, whatever word you adopt to refer to them will come to have the connotation of thoughtlessness and evil or of scheming thoughtfulness. Um, and so there's not, I think, a way around that. So I don't say you have to use the word selfish all the time. Uh, and there are contexts when I do and contexts when I don't, but there's no other safe word that doesn't have that problem. If it does, if it's safe now, it won't be safe in five minutes. And at some point you have to say, look, the problem's not the word. The problem is how we're thinking about ourselves and about what's good and the relationship between them. And you just have to, at some point, take a stand. And you might as well do it on a word that is, has a, a valence that really brings the issue into focus which is what I think Ayn Rand's doing in the title of that, of that uh, book.
Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's interesting about the whole project of, because um, you know, in the in the introduction to the virtue of selfishness, she raises the question herself: Why do you use such a kind of a provocative term? You know, it's just going to upset a lot of people, and this is just going to you're I mean, you're using it to refer to virtuous things. And I think one of the important things about breaking up the package deal uh, is we we talked about or you talked about. Uh, there's this disparate group of people doing various bad or problematic things and we group them together. Uh, and I think she's trying to say, if what you think groups these people together and puts them in a negative box and makes them all one is that they're self-focused, is that they're focusing their lives on themselves. If that's what you think is the common denominator and that, if that's what makes them evil, that's what makes them predators, that's what makes us, that's a major mistake. And it's not about a term or a word that you use. That's a complete misunderstanding of the issue. And if you if you operate with those terms, you're severely hindered in in uh, uh, in, in in thinking about yourself and thinking about other people and thinking about morality. And it's the kind of misunderstanding that's going to shape and inf influence the language, whatever it is. I mean, so when we were kids. Um, If you called someone gay, right, when I was a, a, a adolescent or a, or a teenager, I mean, I interpreted that as an insult. Right? He's gay. He's so gay. Right? Uh, why? I mean, that term was introduced um, by gay people as a positive alternative to homosexual, which sounded too clinical, or various other derogatory terms for them. Right? But it immediately came to be uh, seen as a negative term by everyone I knew and pretty much everyone else. Uh, because those people didn't like gay people. They thought there was something wrong or weird or problem about being gay. And you can change the word as many times as you want. They're all going to get that connotation. And it changes when you start thinking, you know, I, I guess there's really nothing wrong with being. It's the same as anyone else. I, I met a gay guy. He was fine. Right? And when, when people start to think there's nothing wrong with this, then the term gay, you know, doesn't seem negative anymore. And you're always going to at some point uh, have to deal with if people have a prejudice against something or view something as bad, you're not going to be able to uh, get around it with a po more positive sounding word for it. And of course, we could say, you know, gay doesn't mean this sexual orientation. Gay means this sexual orientation paired with, paired with certain negative traits that we suppose come along with that. And of course, you'll find some people who are gay and have whatever negative traits you have in mind, right? Maybe they're... Um, but, and you could use that and say the real word for just the sexual orientation, which we're not morally judging, is this other thing, um, you know. But it'll acquire those connotations too. And at some point, you have to just stand up and say uh, the reason why it's not that we all agree on what's good or bad in sex or what's good or bad with respect to self interest. And we just have to find a word that captures that consensus. It's that we disagree. And that to the extent that there's a consensus, it's a wrong consensus, and that's shaping our language. And that's what happens as attitudes about prejudices about sex and such change, and it's what has to happen as attitudes uh, about self-interest change. Okay, so let me ask you another question we got in different forms. Um, well, let me put it in, in, in one particular kind of way. Do you think there is actually something to something right, uh, something to the idea that all human beings are naturally self-interested? Or is that just, do you think that's just completely wrong or, or is there something to it, but you have something to say about it? Oh, and let me, uh, sorry, let me, Greg, uh, a couple of people have raised their hands. They've clicked the hand raising function. Um, I'm not going to be taking live questions, so feel free to just punch in your question in the Q&A module that's at the bottom of the Zoom screen there. Uh, sorry, yeah, so great. So I think that people do not, as I think about self-interest, it's an abstract perspective that's integrating a lot of different motives into a whole that you recognize is good for yourself. And people are not naturally like that. It's true that people are not naturally and easily self-sacrificers. They're not um, acting against their self-interest in a kind of you know, conscious and deliberate way as children. But if you think about the kind of motives that come early and easily to children, uh, what would it mean to say that they're all self-interested? Well, 
there's something about our biology and maybe about how we're acculturated that makes certain motives natural to form early on. Those are all motives that could be integrated and combined in a way that serves oneself, but they could also be integrated and combined in ways that harms oneself, or they can be left disintegrated as a motley mass that pulls you in different directions and leads your life no focus so that you waste it. So in that sense, children's early motives and the motives that come to people naturally, so to speak, are neither selfish nor unselfish. Are they selfish in the sense of being um, focused on securing kind of obvious things that you might think of as goods for yourself, like food and stuff like that? Well, I mean, some of them are, but then again, not everything you want to eat is really good for you. Uh, and not everything you want to do like that is really good for you. But also a lot of kids' early motives are for favoring things like fairness or helping others or smiling at others. And there's all kinds of psychological research that shows that this exists very early on. So uh, I don't think those things are unselfish or bad for you. I think they're good for you if integrated properly into a whole life, but they are bad for you if integrated wrongly into a whole life. And they're not the kind of things that fit the obvious stereotype of selfishness that is valuing fairness and valuing equal distributions of things, which children seem to do very early on. So I don't think there's a sense in which we're naturally selfish early on. We have certain motives that come naturally to people and come easily. And then there's a question of how, as a person matures, do those motives get integrated into more holistic aims and goals? And are they integrated in a way that's focused on oneself and one's life and making it as good as possible for oneself? Or are they focused on something other than that? Uh, or are they just unfocused in a heap? And I get, we got a question in the chat. I think it's interesting. Um, and I'll just I'll just read it exactly as it is. Uh, so, is self focus on some kind of a spectrum where at an extreme it can be selfish? And I think the person means that in the selfish in a negative sense. Uh, so, is there a continuum of of self focus? Then you move the dial all the way to one end, and you're the selfish, horrible person. Uh, is that the right way to think about it? No, I, I don't think there. I don't think what you'd call self-focus in that um, refers to the same thing. What are you focused on when you're focused on yourself? Are you focused on your your uh, appetite, on your sex drive, on your career, on your um, relationship with your wife, on the freedom of your country? Uh, which thing are you focused on? Are you focused on ten different things, a different one in every moment? and there's no kind of unity to it, so you are, in fact, not focused? Or are you focused on some kind of whole that these things add up to? And if so, what is that whole, and how did you come by it? Uh, so I, I just don't think there's even a thing to be at the one end of the scale. Uh, there's no scale here, as I see. Okay. Uh, so we got a question from David. And he asks, uh, since the concepts of selfishness and unselfishness seem to be so universally misunderstood and usually reversed in their actual meaning, um, how can they begin to be unpacked and properly taught to those who are so thoroughly you know, embedded in the, uh, the wrong way of thinking? Well, we're doing our best. Um, <laughs> I would say one thing. I would first separate out trying to make points about selfishness and self-interest from not using the package deal. So there's a first, a point of cognitive hygiene. Don't refer to jerks, inconsiderate people, these kind of people as selfish. Refer to them by either as bad or irrational or by more specific phrases that identify what's specifically wrong with what they're doing. Like it's inconsiderate, it's thoughtless, it's short range, it's destructive, it's predatory, et cetera, right? So just eschew the package deal from your thinking. And then, uh, and if someone's using it, point out why it's not useful in the ways that we've been talking about, why it's muddying and fog-inducing. And then when you're talking to people about positive things, similarly, try to identify properly what is good about them and what you think is good about them, and not at too abstract a level at first, not like it's selfish and therefore it's good, or it's pro-life and therefore it's good, but like what, what, what actual virtues and traits and skills were involved? What are the results of this? What kind of focus did the person have to have to do it? What do you think is good about it? What do you admire? 
and focus on what's admirable about what you admire at a more concrete level. And then, and do that in your own thinking and do that in your talking to people and then work to integrate those things. Uh, so like say, you know, all of these things, he's really trying to make the most of his life. And there are, you know, elements of this in the culture, which are better that you can pick up on. There's the old army recruitment slogan, be all that you can be, right? That's, you want to be all that you can be. And you look at for things like that and, and try to focus on those things. And I think that um, inculcates more right ways of thinking. And then sometimes you could have a more abstract philosophical discussion where you say, you know, people praise selfish, selflessness and put down selfishness, but that's really a mistake. Um, the most admirable actions come from a strong sense of self and really require it. And, and you know, you could recommend reading Ayn Rand on this, who I think is... Uh, the best uh, author on the subject. Okay, um, let's go to another question. Uh, this question from Rakesh. <clears throat> he asks, um, to judge whether a person is, is selfish or not, how would you interpret the m motive of Bill Gates or of a Bernie Madoff? What's the evidence? Isn't, isn't, isn't one someone who, okay, I can, I'm not sure if I can read this properly. So how do you how do you estimate the motives in effect of people to determine whether or not they're selfish or and I would add is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, well, in general, you you have to infer what someone's motives and character is from what they do and what they say about it. Um, but take the case of Bernie Madoff. You have someone who's doing something which a moment's thought would tell you is not going to work out well for him right? Um, he's doing something that's short range, could only really be driven by kind of panic. Everyone knows the market doesn't go up forever and uh, that you wouldn't be able to kind of carry on this fraud indefinitely. Um, you, you think about how somebody would get into this kind of action. And then if you think about even the goal that it nominally serves, making money and maybe acquiring prestige, it's going to clearly fail at that goal eventually. And then you also think about how does that goal fit into life? Uh, it's clear that what he's doing can't be serving any well thought out long range conception of what will work well for him, what will make his life the best that it can be for him. That's not the kind of thing that could lead to that kind of action. And so it's for the same way that um, if you, uh, you know, uh, see someone, um, you know, bashing their car with a sledgehammer and every car they get, they bash. Well, they, they don't take any care of their car at all. And they, you know, whatever you think, well, he can't be doing it because he's an auto enthusiast, right? It's just, this is not consonant with this view of, uh, of, um, of, of what the motive is. So then you think, well, what would motivate someone to act in this way? And we can, uh, we can think about what it is, right? Um, but it's some kind of short range thinking. It's it's fear. It's not being willing to face uh, what problems you have, and uh, and maybe and so forth. Uh, now, in the case of Bill Gates, you know, it, it, it's sort of often harder to diagnose and be sure of admirable of the causes of admirable behavior than disadmirable behavior, because admirable behavior is longer range and harder. But if you think of someone like Bill Gates, uh, and you really read about his career. This is someone who was long range focused, who had a vision of what could be made that other people didn't have, who um, thought about all the kind of things and implications needed to create it. He was right about it. He recognized what was good and valuable about something, uh, about his vision of, of how the future of technology can go. And he was really driven to achieve that. And I think the more one reads about him and learns about him, the more one could see that that's true, at least for a certain period in his life. And I think that's very admirable and admirable in a way that I think is specifically good for him and based on his own personal value slant on the world and on his life, which he's trying to realize. But that would be uh, a longer talk about him, and I think it would presuppose more positive content about what I think genuine self-interest is than I gave you in this presentation, which was more of a kind of debunking of a package deal a version of self-interest than a presentation of a positive vision of what self-interest is. Let me put three questions into one. They're disparate mm -hmm. questions. Um, one is about, uh, wait, you'll see the comment in a minute. Once, one was in the Facebook uh, 
the people asking questions on Facebook. One was, uh, why would an objectivist want to get married? Okay, so it's partly it's about other people and the role of other people. Um, another person asked on Facebook earlier, um, in, if people pursued their own self-interest, um, would that still, uh, how does that align with the common good? Like, would the good of all be done if every if the good of each was endeavored, <laughs> or if I put it that way? Um, and another question, which is, what would the world look like if everyone were actually selfish in the positive meaning of the world word? So part of it, it's what if everyone were selfish, and what's the role that other people or relations to others or their their well being? How does that fit in? Um. So the, the first one, um, you could ask that about any value. So like, if you were being selfish, why would you want money? Money's not yourself. Uh, if you were selfish, why would you want a job? If you were selfish, why would you want to eat? If you were self, I mean, all of these things are concrete values that uh, can fit into, and in some cases need to fit into a whole life. And that whole life is what's good for you. And now if you think about marriage, not everybody should want to get married to everyone, and maybe some people are better off not being married. But a romantic relationship is a tremendously beneficial thing for your life. Um, you're, and to maintain one long term gives you – is tremendously fulfilling, tremendously enriching to a life, uh, and gives you orders of magnitude greater things than you could get by – a string of short-term dalliances which are really not very rewarding or fulfilling at all. So why wouldn't you want something like that in your life? I mean, what's unselfish about it? Uh, the idea that there's some kind of unselfish character to a marriage or self-sacrificial character to a marriage, um, I mean, you're, you're taking someone that you're partial to and, you know, which is selfish in its own right, right? Uh, and you're, you're having her or him, uh, you know, for your own in a way that's long-term and deep. You're holding them to you. You're taking something that's a cherished value and, and securing it long range. Of course, there's never perfect security. People can change and break up. But you're saying, this is something I really value and she is part of my happiness. This is someone I do and she with me. And um, it's an important part of what I want out of life to have this with her and she wants it with me. And that's I mean, what could be more selfish than that in the sense of what can be more um, pursuing your long-term self-interest? It's the same thing like why would someone who's selfish want to form a corporation or a company? Well, because it, you know, relationships uh, are a big or pursue a long-term project. Well, your life is made of the long-term things you pursue, the commitments you pursue, the things that you value and cherish. And to be selfish is to really want to have them and to maximize them in your life. And marriage is one way of doing that for a certain kind of particularly valuable relationship. Um, as what were the others? Or what would the world in general be like if people were selfish? Well, it would be a world of, I mean, here we need to talk more about than I have uh, about what, because it wasn't the topic of, the, of this call, about what actually is in someone's interest. But basically, I think what's in someone's interest is living productively, ha creating uh, and enjoying the kind of values that a human life uh, requires and that sustain human life. And if everyone was doing that, then the world would be a rich, uh, a place rich in values with tremendous opportunities for all of us to benefit from one another and to benefit from one another selfishly. And to a decent extent, the world is like that, but not as much as it could be. Uh, okay. Oh, so, go ahead, let me just say, I noticed because it's a little thing that's not much commented on and too technical for this call, but Dmitry online is asking about uh, Chernyshevsky and his relationship to Rand. So if you want a little bit on that, look up his name in A Companion to Ayn Rand, which is a book I edited, and you'll get a little, a little on him. And I want to, so uh, Jose sent in a question, and it's really about um, uh, a spouse who goes to great lengths uh, to work hard to raise money for the health care of her spouse. And can you say why this is a rationally selfish act as opposed to an unselfish act? Um, I mean, it looks like the short answer is the, it, if she values him enormously, and much more than the the time she would spend at the second job or whatever, then that is definitely an act of self-interest. But I would also recommend um, 
uh, one of the essays in uh, The Virtue of Selfishness called, um, what, what was it called again? Well, The Ethics of Emergency. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, and okay. also The Conflicts of Men's Interest, but I think The Ethics of Emergencies is the, the main one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree. If the spouse is, a, so if something is of value to you selfishly, if something is of value to you for you, then it's worth working for and uh, sometimes working very hard for. And uh, you have to decide in the case of this value if that's true. But you can't say, well, this requires work, so it's not selfish to do. You might as, you know, um, you could say that about any value and the result would be you should never do anything and you should just veg out and, you know, but that doesn't seem like a life that's good for anyone. Okay, another question. Uh which I think can be answered very shortly. Um, what is your selfish motive in giving this webinar? Um, mine personally, or the uh, institutes for putting it on? Uh, Let's do yours. I enjoy teaching. You, I think a life is some primarily made up by some activity, right? And I mean, a life is actions you do. And you want to find an activity that you think is productive uh, that helps people to live in some way that you enjoy doing personally. And then you can trade your doing that with other people um, to, uh, so that you get the products of their work and they get the products of yours. And I really enjoy teaching. I enjoy the kind of a uh, way of using my life, uh, my mind that's involved in teaching and in kind of thinking through these kinds of questions and, uh, and working out the best ways to communicate them. And uh, I enjoy that I've been able to find a way to get uh, paid to do this because some people think my doing it adds value to their lives and it adds a lot of value to mine to be able to live that way. And this webinar is one particular uh, instance of that. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, what is some guys asking us? Yeah, the, the one in the chat? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Matthew. So let's read Matthew's question here. Uh, can it be selfish to treat people who do bad things well, treat them well, with keeping, I think, while keeping in context your own dignity and theirs and understanding how complex humans are and our limited ability to understand their thought processes? Is this missing from objectivism? Uh, so can it be selfish to treat well people who do bad things while maintaining your own dignity and theirs, given well, how the complex people are? It depends on the bad thing and why you think they're doing it and how well you're treating them. Um, so I think we'd need a lot more concrete. This kind of thing I think could be on the one hand, uh, a rationalization for, injust for injustice and for trying to insulate people from the consequences of their actions and a rationalization for sacrificing yourself to other people's evil or irrationality. Or it could be a, a perfectly reasonable um, uh, claim that you need to take uh, something in context. This guy did something bad, but uh, he's got a lot of other good things about him. And in the grand scheme of things, we have to be proportionate in how we judge it uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, there's, it, I'd have to know more about what kind of case you have in mind. And as to whether it's missing from objectivism, I think uh, the kind of thing I was saying is the kind of thing objectivism uh, would say about it. So if there's something missing, I'm not seeing it, but maybe it would, uh, if there is, it would come out more if we, you know, tried to think about what kind of cases you have in mind. So it, I was going to give the two minute warning. Now I'll give the one minute warning. So we got a minute left. So sadly, we won't be able to really run through more of these questions. Um, how Let me mention them? then on, on that question, if you read Ayn Rand's novels, um, I mean, they're all about people who are, uh, uh, doing something wrong, right? I mean, even the many of the positive characters uh, in, in some respect or another, they have some kind of mistake or compromise, uh, in some cases, even a, a moral error, but most often errors of knowledge and the po other characters, you know, some of, some of them are worth dealing with and they think about, uh, about why um, and, you know, it takes patience and so forth. So uh, these kinds of issues of people being mixed or imperfect and, in what ways it's worth dealing with them. Isn't something Rand didn't address, whether she addressed it, you know, addressed the kind of version of that issue that are salient to Matthew. Uh, you know, again, I think we need to have more of a sense of, you know, 
what's he talking about? If you imagine a situation of, you know, you have a friend or a child who's addicted to drugs or something like that, and you think there's something bad about, you know, how they got into this and what they're doing to themselves, but you also want to help them, um, I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a point at which um, you'd no longer be helping themselves or helping yourself by continue, by indulging them and not letting them face the consequences of it. But there are certainly, uh, you know, things you can do for them before that point. And, and I think it would be wrong not to in some cases. Okay. Given, given the time, do you have any uh, last minute reading recommendations, next webinar, any of that? Uh, well, so the next webinar is uh, Ankar Gattes on, on um, free will. Is it an illusion? Ankar is always really interesting, and that's a, an interesting topic and a controversial topic these days. So I recommend people look at that. Um, for people interested in the topic of selfishness, uh, the first thing, um, main thing to read, particularly for anyone um, uh, who hasn't before, who's new to, to these issues, although the poll indicates there aren't too many such people here, is uh, Ayn Rand's uh, little book, The Virtue of Selfishness, particularly the first maybe four or five chapters of the book. Um, for people who are uh, a little bit further in their studies of these things, I could recommend, uh, though it's a bit pricey, uh, my book edited with Alan Godhealth, uh, a companion to Ayn Rand, and in particular in um, uh, chapters four and six of this book, you'll find a lot on this subject. And then I guess I should plug the most recent book uh, that I'm involved with here, which does have material on this, which is a uh, Foundations of a Free Society, uh, reflections on Ayn Rand's political philosophy, and I have a chapter in here called um, Selfish Regard for the Rights of Others that takes up some of the questions that actually we didn't get to on, uh, on the political implications of all of this and uh, what a society of selfish people would look like. Okay. I guess that's all we have time for. So uh, again, thanks, thanks Greg, for, for doing the webinar, and um, thanks everybody for attending. I hope to see you next week. Actually, I'll be there next week, too. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. I hope this uh, proved in your self-interest. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.